Hi guys, my name's Alexander. I have a horrible case for you, so listen up. I realize it's cliche to describe someone as a person who lights up a room each time they enter. But with Molly, it was true. She was kind, thoughtful, and always saw the best in everybody. Her radiant smile and warm brown eyes had a way of putting everyone she encountered at ease. While Molly struggled with anxiety and self-esteem issues, she refused to let them take over her life. She wrote poetry to express her innermost thoughts and feelings, which in turn helped her gain deeper insights into herself. Molly was a gifted communicator, particularly with children. She spent her summers working at a children's day camp at Greenall Regional Medical Center in Greenall, Iowa. It was no surprise to anyone that Molly hoped to pursue a career as a psychologist for children and young people when she graduated college. Molly Cecilia Tibbetts was born May 8, 1998 in San Francisco, California to Robin Laura, née Calderwood, Tibbetts. She had two brothers, Scott and Jake. When Molly was seven, her parents divorced. Molly and her brothers moved with their mother from California to Brooklyn, Iowa, Laura's hometown, a small farming town of about 1,000 and a half. Despite the distance, the Tibbetts' children stayed in close contact with their father. The move introduced Molly to a very different America, the vast Iowa cornfields, a stark contrast to the sandy beaches and vibrant downtown of San Francisco. Molly settled in well, however, making friends easily and immersing herself in theater and cross-country once she started high school. In the fall of 2017, Molly enrolled at the University of Iowa, located in Iowa City, about 50 miles east of Brooklyn, after a successful freshman year in which she chose to major in psychology, Molly returned home for the summer. It was the 19th of July 2018, a Thursday. 20-year-old Molly Tibbetts didn't show up for work at the daycare center for her summer job in Brooklyn. That wasn't like her, and when her boyfriend Dalton Jack discovered that she wasn't at work, he called her multiple times, but there was no answer. His calls went straight to voicemail. None of her family and friends had seen her that day. Dalton reported her missing to the police. According to Dalton, Molly was home alone the night before, and that was the last time he heard from her. She was staying at his house. He lived with his brother, Black Jack, in Brooklyn, Iowa, United States. Molly was a student at the University of Iowa. She was studying psychology there. When police spoke to Dalton, he told them that he was away for the week for work with his brother and Molly stayed at their house so that she could look after the dogs. Police discovered that Molly was last seen the evening of the 18th of July. Dalton told them he was in his hotel room that night and watched a movie alone. He said that his last communication with Molly was via Snapchat message he received at 10.30 p.m. Police began searching for Molly and discovered that on the 18th of July she went out for a run on a rural road just outside of Brooklyn. A woman, Christina Stewart, spoke to police. She knew Molly and said that she saw her running at 7.45 p.m. on the 18th of July. Christina was driving at the time and drove past her, and as she knew Molly, she was certain it was her. That led police to check for surveillance cameras in the area. The police needed to find out where did Molly run to and where did she go afterwards. For weeks, hundreds of volunteers, friends, family and law enforcement searched for Molly. No trace of her was found. Police got a break in the case when they obtained CCTV footage of Molly running. The footage showed cars driving past her, but one vehicle in particular stood out as it circled back and drove past her again. Police identified the man. His name was Christian Baena Rivera. He was an undocumented Mexican migrant and was working under an alias at a nearby dairy farm, Yara B Farms, and had worked there for four years. A homeowner's surveillance video showed him driving past Molly in his Chevy Malibu. Christian was questioned in relation to Molly's disappearance. 
Initially, Christian claimed that he didn't see Malit that day, but after hours of questioning, he finally admitted that he saw her. He told police that he saw Molly running when he was driving and circled back, as he thought she was hot. Further questioning revealed that all hope of finding Molly alive was over. Christian went on to say that he got out of his vehicle and approached Molly. He ran alongside her and Molly threatened to call the police if he didn't leave her alone. That made him angry and he blacked out. When he regained consciousness, he was inside his vehicle and Molly was inside his vehicle too. She was dead and covered in blood. He drove to a cornfield in Brooklyn and buried her body. Christian led police to the spot where Molly was buried. When police got there, they saw her bright running shoes. Her body was covered with leaves and stalks from the cornfield. An autopsy revealed that Molly had been stabbed several times. Christian was charged with first-degree murder. Despite the fact he led police to the location where Molly's body was buried, Christian pleaded not guilty. As a result, the prosecution would need the jury to determine that even though Christian told police that he blacked out after Molly threatened to call police and found her covered in blood in his vehicle, that the only explanation for that gap in his confession was that he stabbed her to death. It was the prosecution's case that Christian and the only Christian was responsible for Molly's death and that there was nobody else involved in the crime. The jury heard that the prosecution's case would rely on three main points to prove their case. First, a surveillance video that showed Christian's truck drive past Molly when she was running. Second, certain admissions that Christian made to police and the fact he led them to the location where Molly's body was buried. Third, Molly's DNA was found inside his truck. Powishi County Attorney Bart Claver told the court, When you put this evidence together, there can be no other conclusion than that the defendant killed Molly Tibbetts. The court heard that Molly went out the evening of the 18th of July for a run and that she never returned home. Instead, her badly decomposed body was found a month after she was reported missing. Her boyfriend, Dalton Jack, testified. He told the court that he was heartbroken by her death. He described Molly as a happy, bubbly and goofy young woman. He told the court that Molly went out running nearly every day. Dalton testified that they had dated for three years and on the day she went missing, he was out of town for work. He testified that he had been part of a crew building a bridge in Dubuque, which is around 140 miles from Brooklyn. The court heard that the day Molly was last seen alive, he worked a 12-hour shift and then went out and drank beer and played yard games with the rest of the crew. He testified that he didn't return to Brooklyn that night and spend the night in a hotel. The prosecution told the court that when Christian was arrested, he admitted to police that he drove past Molly and when he saw her, he thought she was hot. So he drove back past her again, got out of his truck and ran alongside her, but Molly threatened to call the police, which made him angry. He fought with her and then blacked out. The next thing he recalled was driving and her body, which was covered in blood, was inside his truck. The court heard that he drove to the cornfield, put her body over his shoulder and carried her to the spot where he buried her. He placed stalks from the cornfield over her body. The court heard that Christian led police to where her body was buried and the prosecution told the jury that they believed there was a sexual motive involved in Molly's death. Molly was wearing only socks and a sports bra and her legs were spread when her body was found in a cornfield. The jury were told about Molly's injuries. The autopsy determined that she had been stabbed 7 to 12 times in the chest, ribs, neck and skull. It was determined that she died due to sharp force injuries. The court heard about the other evidence the prosecution had against Christian in terms of DNA. Molly's DNA was found in Christian's truck. Molly's DNA was found in blood spots on the rubber trunk seal and the trunk liner of Christian's Malibu. The prosecution urged the jury to consider all of the evidence in its entirety. And if they did that, there would be no doubt in their mind that Christian was guilty. 
The defense disagreed. It was the defense case that Christian did not stab Molly. They described him as a hardworking immigrant from Mexico who crossed the border illegally when he was a teenager in search of a better life. His attorney, Jennifer Fries, told the jury that police were too quick to close Molly's case and that her family deserves justice. But so does Christian Bahena Rivera. The defense alleged that Christian was pressured into making a false confession. She described her client as a yes man and said that he always did anything he was asked to do. She told the jury that when police questioned him, it took place over the course of hours and hours and after he had just worked a 12-hour shift. She told the jury that his confession was false and coerced. The confrontation continued until it was put in my client's head, perhaps you blacked out. The state in this case, they got what they wanted, and they closed the case. They got what they needed. There was an intense amount of pressure to close this case, to arrest someone for this vicious crime. The defense argued that Christian never admitted that he stabbed Molly and that was due to someone else being involved. They attempt to cast suspicion on Dalton. They told the jury that Dalton was far from the perfect boyfriend and in fact had a short temper. Dalton admitted on the stand that he had a short fuse and got into fights in the past. The defense also told the jury that Dalton was not a loyal boyfriend. Dalton testified that he had screwed up and cheated on Molly. When asked if Molly had been aware of his infidelity, he confirmed that she found out about it. She found out when she looked through messages on his phone. But Dalton claimed they had moved past it and worked through it. Yet further questioning by the defense revealed that just three days before Molly went missing, she was still upset about it and the day before she was last seen alive, she discussed it again. The defense showed Dalton his phone records. They revealed that he only called Molly once in the days after she went missing, despite her body not being found until a month later. The defense told the jury that Dalton received what they described as an odd question via text message from a woman who he had previously had a relationship with. The message was sent after Molly was reported missing and when hundreds of people were searching for her. It read, Dalton, is Molly alive? Dalton admitted that he made mistakes and wasn't honest. He admitted he initially told police that he was watching a movie in his hotel room on the night Molly disappeared. He confirmed that he told police his last communication with Molly was a snapshot he received at 10.30 p.m., but he actually received it after 1 a.m., but he denied having anything to do with Molly's death. Christian testified. He told the court that when he told the police what happened, he wasn't truthful, as he was afraid that his former partner and child would be harmed. He told the court that he was not responsible for Molly's death and two other men were. He testified that on the 18th of July, he was taking a shower when two men, who he did not know, broke into a trailer where he lived. They were masked. One of the men had a knife and the other man had a gun. According to Christian's testimony, they forced him to drive to the rural road just outside Brooklyn to the spot where Molly was. Christian testified that one of the men killed Molly and put her body in his vehicle. They then instructed him on where to dispose of her body. According to Christian, they then threatened him. He was told to remain quiet or his former girlfriend and daughter would be killed. That was why he claimed that he told police that he approached Molly and blacked out instead of telling them the truth. The defense called forensic consultant Michael Spence to testify in relation to DNA found in Christian's truck. He agreed that it was Molly's DNA that was found on bloodstains in the truck, but he testified that other DNA was found that included at least one unknown male and female. The mother of Kristen's daughter testified. Her name was Iris Gamboa, and she testified that she lived with him for four years. The relationship ended in 2017, but she described him as a good father, and every month he paid $500 in child support for their daughter. And also 
also sent money back home to his parents in Mexico so that they could build a new house. When asked if he was ever violent towards her, she told the court that he wasn't and never showed any excessive anger. The jury deliberated for seven hours and found Christian guilty of first-degree murder. Before his sentencing hearing took place, the defense asked for time to follow up on two claims that were made after the guilty verdict was announced. The judge delayed the sentencing hearing to allow them to do so. When the defense obtained the details in relation to the new information, they brought a motion before the court seeking a new trial for Christian. The court heard that the new information related to claims made that suggested that there was evidence that others were responsible for Molly's death and had only been made known to the defense after the guilty verdict was reached. Two people told police that a man confessed to them that he killed Molly. They claimed that a 21-year-old man called Gavin Jones told them that he was responsible. One of the men, inmate Arnie Mackay, said that Gavin told him of his involvement when they were both held at the Keoka County Jail. According to Arnie, Gavin said that he stabbed Molly with another man, cut her up and wrapped her in plastic. He told him that she had been held at a sex trafficking trap house before her death that was owned by a man involved in the sex trafficking trade. That man was later identified by various media reports as being James Manuel Lowy. The plan was for Molly to be sex trafficked, but due to how much publicity her disappearance received, they knew that could no longer happen. The defense argued that due to this new information, a new trial was required. The court heard that James was a suspect in the disappearance of 11-year-old Xavier Harrelson, but he was not charged in relation to that case. He was not charged in relation to Molly's case either. When police spoke to Gavin, he denied any involvement. He was in a rehabilitation facility in the summer of 2018 and then in an assisted living facility under state supervision. The defense also told the court that a woman came forward and told police she was kidnapped after meeting an alleged sex trafficker at a Brooklyn gas station weeks before Molly's disappearance. She claimed a man pointed a gun at his own head and said that Mexican shouldn't be in jail for killing Molly Tibbetts because I raped her and killed her. The defense argued that due to the new information relating to the man and the sex trafficking claim and the woman at the gas station, the guilty verdict should be set aside as it was unsafe and a new trial should be ordered. The judge disagreed. When the new evidence was presented before him, a month after he delayed the sentencing hearing, he concluded that it was unreliable and there was no reason before him that would cause him to overturn the verdict. In fact, he pointed out that the statement that Gavin allegedly made did not match the evidence. Molly had not been cut up or wrapped in plastic. The judge also said many of the new allegations conflicted with the defense's case and evidence that they themselves had presented at trial. Their motion was denied, and the judge, Judge Joel Yates, told them that he would proceed with sentencing Christian. Addressing Christian in court, he said, You and you alone forever changed the lives of those who loved Molly Tibbetts. Iowa does not have the death penalty. And as Christian was found guilty of first-degree murder, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The punishment also included an order that Christian must pay the Tibbetts family $150,000 in restitution. Molly's mother, Laura Calderwood, addressed Christian in a victim impact statement that was read to the court. I come here to give a voice to our daughter, granddaughter, sister, girlfriend, niece, cousin and friend Molly Cecilia Tibbetts. Molly was a young woman who simply wanted to go for a quiet run on the evening of the 18th of July and you chose to violently and sadistically end that life. Because of your act, Molly's father Rob will never get to walk his only daughter down the aisle. Because of your act, Mr. Vera, I will never get to see my daughter become a mother. The statement described how difficult it was for Laura to tell her own mother, Judy Calderwood, about Molly's murder, especially due to her mother's strong faith. She believed Molly would be found alive. The statement read, 
I very quietly and softly said, Mom, I have some bad news. They found Molly's body this morning. Judy Calderwood's unwavering faith had been brutally shattered by a senseless act of violence. The prosecutor in the case, Scott Brown, believed that jury got the verdict right and that the sentence was the correct one. Based upon the facts and circumstances of this case, it is very well deserved. Molly's death received a lot of attention in the media and in politics. When Christian was arrested, the president at the time, President Donald Trump, blamed U.S. immigration laws for her death, and Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds called Christian a predator who slipped through a broken immigration system.